Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the first in the new monthly webinar series, AI Analytics and Automation, which will happen the fourth Tuesday of every month with Nick White. Today, Nick will discuss demystifying AI for business leaders. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you the speaker of this new monthly series, Nick White. Nick is a seasoned professional with over two decades of experience, expertise, and is dedicated to driving impactful business outcomes through the strategic application of data analytics and AI. His extensive experience spans diverse industries, showcasing a passion for leveraging data's transformative potential to fuel innovation, optimize decision-making, and streamline operations. Nick is recognized for his adaptive Depthness in assisting organizations across various industry verticals, consistently achieving positive business results through data-driven strategies. And with that, let me give the floor to Nick to begin his presentation. Hello and welcome. Hi, Jan, and thanks for building me up so much. I'm really hoping I can live up to it. And thanks for everybody for coming to uh, the first episode here. Um, man, I feel so domestic. I'm in Madison and we have people from you know, Canada, which is, you know, Diet Detroit from where I grew up, uh, felt like we were kind of Canada, but weren't. London, Germany, thank you all for taking the time. I hope you don't fall asleep because it's later at night and uh, I'm going to try to keep it light here. So um, if you've ever attended any of my webinars, you know, I'm going to look at the chat. I'm going to try to see what you guys have to say. So I really don't want this to be a stand to deliver, but I also know we're tight on time, so I'm not going to sit here and talk too much. All right, so today, this is all about for business leaders, executives, you know, what's the deal with AI, uh, to quote my favorite Jerry Seinfeld. Um, you know, and I wanna go through it in this way. Here's the reality. Here's how people are talking about it. So don't feel bad if you don't understand everything about what people are saying. I'm gonna try to get you there. And then I also want to start to help inspire, how do we think big about things? How do we start small about things, you know, in this space so that we don't get overwhelmed or over our skis? So at the end of this, I will feel successful if you are an executive or a business leader and you feel empowered to drive innovation with AI. Um, or if you're a data professional and you are equipped to educate your organization about AI, because a lot of this, as we know in data, is all about being able to explain you know, the information, the content, the data to a lot of different types of people. And then the third one is maybe you're just a user and you can walk away and understand how to better use AI. Um, very, very important um, that we get to these. If you want to plug into the chat, like, hey, which, which one of these do you fall into? Are you one of our business leaders? Are you a data professional? Or are you just somebody who really, really, really wants to know what should I do with this AI, go ahead and plunk that in the webinar chat. Um, again, I'll be monitoring it as I go through it, um, but I'm gonna get started. All right, yeah, data pros. The reality, so this isn't like a scared straight scenario, but it is just, I do just wanna say, there's a lot of words that are being thrown out there about AI. Um, and quite frankly, they keep changing them. So even if you thought one thing was one thing and now I'm saying it's another, it's probably because it changed or maybe it's changed between the time I finished this presentation and the time we're talking about it. So let's get into that. So we're all feeling this, I think, here. You know, we know AI can be used for productivity right now. And there are statistics that literally say that, right? So if we just think about customer service agents where everybody wants to use this, right? Like how many of you have been asked to make a chat bot or have been able to use a chat bot? You know, you can get some pretty significant productivity gains there, right? 14%. But what's really interesting is when you get into places like where 
knowledge workers, professionals, consultants like me, I mean, you're looking at 40% performance improvement, you know, so highly skilled non-technical workers using large modal, you know, multimodal models, language models, huge uptick. And then for everybody here, that's maybe a little more on the technical side. If you've been messing with GitHub Copilot, or you've been using Codex, or you've been using some version, I mean, there is just tremendous amounts of productivity gains for developers in there. And I have to think this is just starting to touch on what's possible, right? We're not even talking about agents or anything like that. We're just talking about, hey, can I just bolt you onto what I'm doing and help me find things, make clever presentations, all of that good stuff faster. We're also looking at a world where we don't even realize how AI has already transformed our world, but it's really going to transform a lot of things very, very, very soon. You know, just think about the amount of money um, that is being thrown at OpenAI, the amount of funding, all of that stuff. That is, I mean, that is just tremendous. Like people are betting on this because it's going to win. And I can't stress enough, this is going to change your organization wherever you're at. This is going to change your life wherever you're at. I don't even know how to tell my daughter what to worry about <laughs> as she's going through school, right? Like how much will she have to, you know, do some of the old time? I'm going to throw out an old one to see how old everybody is. But, you know, like follow the APA style guidelines in your research paper. Is that even a thing anymore? But at the end of the day, I know it's going to help us with productivity now and 1000% transform the way we work. So <clears throat> I would love, I would love to, um, and of course, images generated by AI. So um, any likenesses are completely accidental. But, you know, you hear that stuff and maybe you're an executive or a business person, or, you know, maybe you work with an executive or a business leader who's like, I'm all in, how can we do everything? Um, in the chat, are, are people just, you know, in your organization going crazy? I'm all in. Like there's only good stuff coming out of it. And then you have to go in and maybe you feel a little bit like a buzzkill because you're like, yeah, well, you know, it's not that simple. So feel free to chat about that in the webinar chat. I'm gonna go through it at the end anyway. Um, but definitely if you have that executive, that CEO, that business leader, maybe even that functional leader that's just like, we got to go all in. Like, how do we just have robots everywhere? And we're kind of there. Um, so that's that's the all in portion of it. But the reality is that, great point, it is not a panacea. And man, I'm here to burst some bubbles if you think it is. It's not easy. I mean, 85% of AA projects never make it to production. 96% of AI products run into data quality labeling and just building model confidence. And 81%, you know, people get into it, they start training it, and it's harder than they think it is. Um, it's just the reality. It's It's got a high potential. It has for a while, but it's not easy. And it hasn't quite delivered on what we want it to. And oh, by the way, all of these risks, um, Apologies if you've heard me talk before. Hopefully you guys are returning customers, um, you know, to my shop of AI talks. But at the end of the day, there's quite a bit of risks. And like, think of them in two different ways. They're not even, they're risks for our planet, right? And ethical, because there are things that can, you know, push bias. It can, you know, the amount of consumption and compute and storage and energy, like there's all these things that could be very hurtful or not, you know, not in a good way for society from an ethical perspective, but each one of these also have a huge commercial dimension to them. So we have to be scared a little bit, but we don't have to be that scared. So I don't know, like, so if you have the business leaders or you're feeling as if, you know, oh, they're all in, maybe you have one that's like this, which is like, get these terminator terminators away away from me you might even want to go into you know something like um getting the uh getting the west world robots away from you right so 
you know, those are the two extremes of reactions we can have, um, you know, but everything's in nuance, right? Like, just like me, AI is old. No, I'm not quite as old as AI, you know, however, I always like to settle on this slide because let's just think about it. It's been there. Like, it's been there since the 50s. It's probably been there before. It's analog. But, you know, just like anything that's discovered, this is old. And AI is a general term. And then you have machine learning. And then you have deep learning. And then everybody loves generative AI. And now we're calling everything generative AI. Um, or we're calling everything co-pilots. Or we're calling everything Gemini. Or we're calling everything chat GPT. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of nuance and it's great to have all this heat behind it, but we just have to understand that it is a little bit older. Um, you cannot, I cannot talk about AI without talking about generative AI, um, which is just basically, hey, we're gonna use it to generate something new or novel. And that includes things that are text or language visuals. So you keep seeing these videos, these deep fakes, all that stuff. Thank goodness I'm married because I definitely get catfish today even worse than I probably did before. And then you have, you know, creating audio, music, what's going to happen? You know, how are we going to go? Um, you see a black screen. Can people in the chat tell me if they're able to see the see presentation? If you're I'll, I'll monitor that, Nick. I, you're good. Okay, cool. Yeah. See, so that just proves that I was looking at the chat. So anything you say, be nice. All right, cool. Um, then you got code, which I would say is kind of, that's just another language and then visual generation. So I think it's important that, you know, yes, we're generating things. This is what we're talking about, you know, but behind that, just like I showed you, there's all these deep learning models. These deep learning models have been around for a long time. Um, you have your language models. You have computer vision. Hopefully sometime they'll call them, you know, something different, but computer vision is what it is today. You have ASR, automatic speech recognition, and then you have multimodal, which is, hey, can we just do whatever? And if you look, saw like the spring demonstration that OpenAI had around GPT-4 O, O for Omni, and even the Gemini stuff coming out, it's kind of crazy. Um, this is the way we're going. And you're going to see them probably, you know, evolve a little bit more, which I'll get into, you know, uh, more specifics. But most of the big cloud providers have some version of it um, or are creating their own version of all of these. And then, of course, you, you have to, <laughs> whatever you think about OpenAI at this point, you have to get them give them credit for forcing the in forcing the, you know, idea of allowing foundational models, you know, which are what we're dealing with a lot in this, so that everybody's kind of getting access to some version of it, and it's being a little more equitable. Um, however, bringing it down to <laughs> reality again, AI is just one aspect of the data-driven organization. And I say that because AI is not the answer to everything. It's not a panacea. It's not a silver bullet. Pick your overgeneralized thing. It is just one thing we can do in analytics, advanced analytics, whatever you want to call it, to create an experience to drive a business outcome. And my data peeps on here, and I know we are all coming from the same place as I have a very weird AI slash data governance background <laughs> is it still is garbage without data governance and management and the right creation and ingestion. Um, and yes, like William, you are definitely kind of leading into exactly how I believe we need to do all of this. But at the end of the day, you have your front stage, which is all of the experiences and things that happen. So think of a, think of a theater and then you have your backstage where a lot of the hard work happens and the props are stored and the people coming on stage next are. But at the end of the day, AI is just one aspect. And I have to say that. So hopefully, when you have that more nuanced view, you're hoping that as a business leader, as an executive, as somebody in an organization with, you know, trying to be innovative, it's let's try. It's not AI is going to kill us all. 
it's not replace everybody with machines, but it's like, let's figure out how we try to use this to improve outcomes for ourselves and our organization. And there's two ways AI can create value. One, do you want to grow faster? Two, do you want to get leaner? Now, one of the things that I encourage organizations to look beyond is the get leaner. Yes, yes, we want to save productivity. We want to save time. We want to save money. But don't get caught in the trap of just looking right in front of you. You know, what can you do if somebody doesn't have to do busy work because of AI? That's the grow faster part. Like if you're not thinking of both of these, you're missing the point of AI and you will be left behind. So I always like to put this up here because right now we're just thinking about, or at least what I hear the chatter is, is not how do we augment humans so that they can go do things that are adding even more value to our organization. And I know this is going to sound a little foofy, but also the world, you know, but that's how we should be thinking is how do we stop doing busy work so that we can do things that humans are great at, like creating things like AI models. So never forget that. Then there's just, how are you going to approach it? You know, you might hear you're a laggard or you're cutting edge, but think about an innovation curve, right? You know, 5% will be leading edge. If you're not doing something and you're not like already failing or creating different ways to genetically alter, you know, different crops, then you're probably not leading edge right now. Um, and if you're not just using it right now, you're probably not proactive. And if you're here and you're like, okay, I just want to know how to do it. Well, you're a little reactive, but that's okay because that's the biggest bucket. And the name of the game is which, which like, one third or which third of this do you want to belong in and growing your way towards that. And I want to talk a little bit more about how you get there. But at the end of the day, this is just like any innovation. You're either a wait and see, you're a be pragmatic and, you know, try to be proactive about it, or you are going all out. Um, and Dawn, I see your last, you know, comment. Yeah. I mean, it's not. That's why I always have to talk about chatbots because chatbots are like, you know, they seem great, but it's just one aspect even of AI. Um, so we have to think about how it can change everything. Like, why is Microsoft investing so much? Why is Google investing so much? And I also want us to think about some of the better innovations that have happened in the past several years are using some version of AI or data-driven applications, right? Let me tell you one thing, spell check, do we think that's AI? <laughs> it is, you know, like how about when I'm writing an email and it knows what I'm going to say or what I should say, I'm like, oh, great. Yeah, let's autofill that. It's been around right now though, because of what's happened with opening up foundation models to everybody, now we all have a little bit more um, access to some of the power that has been going on for a while that's just been mainly focused on you know, creating profit for only certain organizations. So we're at a really cool point and we need to embrace it, but also be pragmatic. And then we're never gonna forget this, right? Never gonna forget this. Gen AI, is just a tool. It makes it a lot easier for us to get some very fast, quick value. But at the end of the day, it's only as good as the strategy you have. So again, are you what, what business goals are we meeting with this? The expertise you have, not only in the build, but also the maintain, and even more so, do our end users know how to talk to these things or prompt these things or whatever? so that we get value out of it. And then finally, data quality, get go all day. I'll say it all the time. You know, it's not gonna fix bad data. And it's, I've said this before, I've had a lot of people steal this, but 
we have to think of these foundation models as genius five-year-olds. And I can say this because my girl just, my girl just turned six, but how, we have to tell it how to think and we have to tell it what information to use to think on. Um, and these are the three things that if we just don't pay attention to it, we're not gonna get much out of it. So again, don't be scared. Don't be over enthusiastic, but be pragmatic about it and like pick how innovative you want to be. And, you know, as innovative as you want to be, you know, you have to remember that a big part of it, and I'll talk about it, is creating a culture of innovation. Um, this is, there's no guarantees in this space and there won't be for a while. So just keep that in mind. All right. All this lingo flying around. This is going to be intense. Um, Shannon sends out a PDF of this. You will have a recording of this. Um, you do not have to scribble notes, and I'm just saying that, you know, because it'll. This is also being, you know, recorded and all that good stuff. So just, you know, try to take what you can now. Um, throw some Q and A in there, and I'll get to them, even if it's not during this meeting. At some point, make sure I get back to you. Um, you know, I'm not going to claim that I reinvented this table. Um, all I'll say is that, you know, working with one of the large providers, you know, kind of was inspired to create something that just says, hey, I know we keep thinking AI is GPT and Copilot and this, that, and the other, but it's everywhere. It's in applications. Sure, chat GPT, um, it's right in there. Um applications with AI, when we start to think about it, I just alluded to it, you know, spell check, <laughs> um, filling out your email and suggesting things where you just hit a tab. Like those are all, that's all been AI and they're just getting more powerful with things like Copilot and Gemini. No code AI platforms. Okay. This is where we can start creating our own, you know, it's not quite hardcore data science, but, you know, we can create our own co-pilots. We can create our own GPTs. Um, there's been a lot of business rule engines. If you just think about how a lot of those no-code type of scenarios work, it exists here in AI. AI applied models. So just think about, like, back in the day, you might have, you know, even auto ML kind of fits into here a little bit, but, like, this idea that I can go to a cloud service provider and basically use their version of search. Like there is a, um, there is a company called Google that is the king of search, right? Um, you know, that's been available for people to use in different scenarios. Same thing with document, you know, OCR reading documents and being able to convert them chat. Bot. I mean, these have all been out there, but just think about like, hey, there's a pretty common problem that a lot of people like to solve. You know, those those are there. Like, you don't have to create your own. You can just use it. Um, Pre-trained models. Um, so AI foundation models. And I I, I have the new star. I tried to fit in new-ish because it's new-ish. Because the idea is these foundation models have always existed. But the fact that we get access to them is new. And it's really cool. Um, so... This is kind of the, the layer below. Okay, I'm going to use GPT-4 to then build my thing that does this specific thing for me, right? Like, so now I'm going a level below because the AI applied models, there's not really something for what I need to do. Um, so I use that. And then you have your AI platforms, you know, like this is where you go and build your own models and you forecast and you do cool things like that. So, you know, at the end of the day, you can't have the things, you know, at the top or above one or the other without the things below it. And right now, just make sure you 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 choose the right service level for your use case. And think about like I boil down buy versus build in very, you know, black and white terms. Buy no competitive advantage. Build competitive advantage. So and this is almost like buy, build, or a little bit of both. There's a lot of options here that make it a lot easier to avoid some of those poor numbers of AI delivering value. So just like to throw that in, and I want to spend a little bit of time 
um, on AI foundation models, which is the new ish, you know, kid on the block. So how are they created? And this is, you know, kind of like a, a GPT type of situation. Unsupervised pre-training, you know, they kind of start with that. So what does that mean? You know, I'll get into these you know, definitions, but it's basically telling your algorithm or your AI model to go learn stuff and figure out what's going on. Um, so if you just consider the fact that a lot of the most popular models were trained on the internet, that's why it's really good at kind of knowing, you know, well, you know, ugh, man, this person doesn't seem happy in this customer review. Just think about what the internet is. Like, I don't want to call it a cesspool, but there's a lot of stuff in there that it gives us a lot of, it gives it a lot of background on how humans talk and, you know, definitely in certain ways. So just think about that. And there is some labeling that happens, you know, and there's reinforcement learning, you know, so just making sure that, okay, what you're coming up with, that's good or not, reinforcement learning. Adversarial testing, this was really important. When you hear things like hallucinations or bias or like, you know, hey, tell me how to do something that's harmful to other people. Like this is kind of pressure testing, right? And making sure that it's not doing anything it shouldn't do. And then, you know, eventually these things end up somewhere, you know, so chat GPT, co-pilot, um, what is now Gemini. And even if you go and search on Google, you know, it, they're, they're embedding more and more AI into it. So these are how they're created. Now, the hard thing is that it's not always clear. You know, they can be a different, you know, type of black box or gray box, if you want to call it. So, you know, here are some definitions for you to kind of think about. I try to go through it. You know, fine tuning is not, was not on there, but there is a little bit of fine tuning. It's something you can do with these if you really need to. And then prompting. Prompting is just telling it how to think, asking it the right questions the right way. It can be done in a developer envir environment where we call it prompt engineering, or every time you interact with some, one of these models, you are prompting yourself. So that's why you can get some really weird things coming at you because it needs a lot of you know direction. And then grounding data is really data that you use. And you'll hear like, you know, there's a term called RAG out there, which uh, RAG architecture is just um, being able to use some data that's specific to your use case using a big language visual multimodal model and telling it to use its understanding of language to then go and seek out the right answer in data that is very specific to your use case. So. Think about, you know, I hate to bring up a customer service chat, bot, but just think about the idea that if you have SLAs or if you have, you know, manuals for a machine, using a RAG architecture can be pretty powerful because, you know, you don't have to fine tune it, which costs a lot of money and a lot of time. You can kind of just, that's why these things are so cool, these foundation models, is you can just kind of, you know, say, hey, think this way with the prompt and grounding data and use that as your source of truth. Um, you know, so things to think about there. Let's break down um, foundational models. Um, retrieval, augment, generation. So RAG architecture is just using grounding data to tell it, hey, this is the source of truth. Um, that way you don't just ask GPT a question and it hallucinates. It's a really good way to avoid hallucinations because you're telling it exactly this is the book of information I want you to use. Um, so let's talk about, there are two factors we have to think about um, when we talk about AI foundation models. One is availability. All right, so this is, you've heard of open source, closed, closed source, open AI, you know, the open meant open source. Now they've started to close some things for different reasons and we can be nice about it. We can not be nice about it. It's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, that's what availability means. And then size, like these things can be ginormous. 
they can also be small. They can also be kind of in the middle. For purposes of this, let's just think about, you know, large and small. So large are the most powerful ones, you know, like your GPT fours and threes, um, like your Gemini pros, um, and even um, Meta has theirs that's called Llama 7B. It's basically when you see something like 7B or you hear the thing parameters, it's how much it's been trained on, you know, so it's really good if you know, just think about the person that would be really good at Jeopardy versus a person that's like, you know, very good at being a specialized doctor or something, you know, so a large language model is Ken Jennings, right? And then like the best kind of surgeon in the world at a specific thing, you know, those are like small models that are trained very specifically. So let's just keep that in mind. Okay, this is a lot of text. It's an eye chart again. I'm going to try to go over it very quickly, but at the end of the day, you know, open source, you know how it's, you know how the sausage is made, how it was made, what was used to make it, all of that good stuff. It's available. Um, and it's really cool to use in R and D. Like these are, if you just think about, think about the power of this and all of the great stuff that's going to happen around you know, health outcomes, you know, solving all sorts of complex problems, having an open source model is, is the thing. And you can customize it and it's very transparent. So one of the interesting things is, and you'll see at the bottom, I give you example models, right? GPT-2, open source. GPT-3 and 4, not so much. Now they're closed, right? Um, but if you look at what Meta is doing, and this is kind of an interesting thing, is Meta creates Llama, you know, and <laughs> some of these acronyms are crazy. But at the end of the day, they've decided, hey, we go open source with this. You know, it's going to be better than GPT-5. And, it, you know, it's a choice. And there's definitely things that are good about it and bad about it. For example, open source you're not gonna use that for commercial applications. So I, I put this one first because for me, this is a very easy answer for most people. You're gonna go closed source. You're, so you're gonna to go to a place where things are safe. It's not being trained. You're not opening, you know, you're not popping the hood to your business. Closed source is very, you know, secure, commercial applications, you know, and then what you'll see is that it's going to, of course, something that's closed is going to cost more because now somebody's trying to sell you their version of something. So just keeping that in mind um, and just kind of look at, I, I threw Amazon Alexa in there, not the greatest example of like being terrific, but you know, at the end of the day, it is an example. And then you have your GPT fours and your Gemini. So that's availability. So all I would say is, for 95% of you, I'll say 99, closed source, you're going to pick a closed source model. And, you know, things like, you know, just a nuance there is GPT-4, you can get it from OpenAI. You can get it from um, Microsoft. That's kind of the deal that they have. So it's there and it's available. Um, both are secure, but, you know, OpenAI is a little a little more cutting edge and Microsoft is, you know, doing a little more due diligence, you know, just around security and things of that nature. So it is a choice, but just so you kind of understand that nuance, if you're super concerned with security, you definitely want to go with, you know, a big cloud provider who is, you know, providing these through, if you have a little more idea of risk and, and do it by use case. It's not one thing for the whole organization. It's just pick the right the right model for the right um, use case. And then you get into large and small. This is, yeah, Don, I'll definitely do that just around the um, behavior and ethics. So um, model size, everybody wants to use a large foundation model for everything. These are the biggest, most powerful, but it's not always, it's not always the right thing to do. Like, you know, so, if you're going to use a large foundation model, 
either it's a basic thing out of the box that doesn't need a whole lot of specificity to it, but it needs like a broad understanding of language and a broad understanding of, you know, again, image recognition, like computer vision, like those are really good ones. So when you think about, you know, use cases in highly text heavy um, industries like legal services or things of that, like, there are things where I just need, give me as much power as you got. And these are being used a lot, you know, in things like medicine as well. So just kind of know that's out there. I want to turn everybody's attention to small foundation models. I think there's so much focus on large, but like, if I'm a business leader, I want to ask, why are we using, like, what is the rationale behind using maybe a very large model versus a, a smaller model? And the reason I say that is because most of the differentiating value and real value you're going to get is probably going to come down to using a small foundation model. They're cheaper to use. They're usable on, you know, like they are usable on, you know, a personal computer, you know, edge computing. If you just think about, you know, all of that stuff, even, you know, when we talk about, you know, GPT-4, oh, all of the folks that have created these ginormous models are trying to shrink them somehow um, because they know the performance issue and the ability to make them very bespoke is going to be important in the future. And you can kind of see like, you know, Microsoft has done a good job with Phi 1 or Phi 2, Phi 3, Orca 2, like, you know, Mistral you might've heard of, you know, even Meta has an 8 billion. Yes, 8 billion is, I'm considering small in air quotes, right? And then like Databricks, like, so all I, I'm just pointing this out because take away from this that don't like, do not bring a bazooka to a fist fight kind of thing. Like make sure you're using, you know, the right size. And I would even say, make sure you're not using AI when you just need a dashboard. Um, so there are things to consider there. And I would say the more that you use large foundation models, the more apt you are to have ethical and bias issues because they're more of a black box. Um, they're trained on so much that it's really hard to understand what they're going to do. And if you're really thinking about large closed foundation models, we really don't know what's going on. They were trained on books. They were trained on the internet. They're running out of the internet to read. So it's a thing we got to keep in mind. Here's my garbage in garbage out slide. At the end of the day, if we're going to do something like use GPT or create a chatbot, we need gold level data. Look up the medallion architecture. I'm not going to get into it. That'll probably be in a different, <laughs> a different version or episode of this. But at the end of the day, make sure that your, your data is ready to be used. Um, and also don't skip steps here. Make sure that you're, you know, taking your time to understand the data and get as much context as you can from the business users. All right, so how do we get started? How do we think big and start small? One, without a culture of innovation, you will continue to be disappointed because you need cross-functional teams. This is not a technology thing. This is a business technology and data thing. And if you don't have some sort of way to focus on having mixed teams work on this together, have an equal seat at the table, you're really going to struggle to get anything that drives those business outcomes. Continuous learning. You are going to fail a ton. Um, you are going to think one thing is the solution and it's not. You have to be okay with that. You know, um, knowledge and learning, those are values. And if you don't look at learning as a value, then you're going to struggle you know, you might as well wait, you know, you might as well be reactive or super reactive and just wait for a sure thing. Um, and then I always bring this in. And again, I'll probably go into it in a future um, episode, but having a design thinking culture as well is just about, you know, making sure you know exactly what the problem is before you start solving it. And that means 
Don't have a bunch of assumptions. Don't go too fast. You know, really provide that kind of front stage, backstage, iterative thinking that's needed. Um, so that's number one. Without that, it's going to be really hard. Number two, focus on outcomes. This is one of my favorite eye charts in the world. But at the end of the day, whether you have shareholders, stakeholders, whatever, you know, it's all about how do we figure out how we're providing value to the people that own the business, right? Um, and that's either, can I make more profit? Can I limit, you know, my costs? <laughs> can I increase how much? Can I get tighter on operations? Can I manage my assets better? Can I position us strategically better? So culture of innovation, relentless focus on outcomes, not outputs. Did we, do we know what the KPI is? And did we impact it the way that we wanted to? That is so important, no matter how you get there. I don't care if it's a sell and excel, it doesn't matter. We need to get, we need to focus on that and then keep getting better over time. You must use a holistic approach. Like think about, and this is a, a framework that we've been using at Origin to talk through Gen AI versus traditional machine learning and how do you productize it in your head? How do you know, well, this is what it can do and I need to do something like that. So, you know, just thinking about, do I need, do I need to find insights faster and to drive better decisions and easier? Insights assist. Do I need to forecast, can I, do I need to predict the future better? Like, so that I can, you know, be more efficient and, and grow revenue? Do I just need somebody to take a very complicated decision and recommend something? I mean, I always go back to, you know, Google Maps, Apple Maps, Waze. Like, these are recommending which way you should go. I'm telling you, this stuff's all around us. And you can apply this in so many different ways in your org. Creator Assist. I mean, this is really something that has been, you know, um, been able to be increased just because of the large language models and things like that. But like, hey, how do we create more content cheaper? How do we, you know, how do, we, how do we think about that? And then what about process? Like, I don't know about anybody on here, but I, if you give me something where it's a very hard process to follow, and maybe had I been doing something for 20 years, I would know all the answers. But just think about a process assistant, like how do I make somebody who's new to the job almost as good as somebody who's been there forever? So like, are there workflows I can help with? And I don't have to fully automate them, but can I just help them along? Um, it's one of the big ways where, you know, when people come about customer chatbots, I go, okay, cool. But like, couldn't your customer service reps use some help? Because not all questions can be answered by a bot. But maybe it's just, you know, this idea of a human and AI working together to better, better um, execute that. Start with a strategy. I'm not going to milk this, but without a use case, you don't have a strategy. <laughs> um, without a roadmap, you're kind of doing one-offs. So really focusing on agile mindset, collaborative delivery, and everything is based on a use case. What do I mean by this? Again, I'm not, you're going to be able to read this when you get a chance, but at the end of the day, think big. How are you going to change the customer experience with some sort of chat bot, you know, and then start small. Where's all the value? Like, where do I start? Um, and it's usually wherever that cross section of low hanging fruit and value exists and you start there, but then You've already thought big, so now you know the whole. Now you know the whole thing. Um, it's just a different way to think through it. Product, not project. And I'll say this, and I know I'm in good company. Any a AI strategy needs a data strategy. You know, it's. I can't say it enough. It's a part of it. They're very similar, and I mean, I'm telling you. AI is a part of this continuum and we can't separate it just because it can do a lot of cool things right away right now. And the whole point of data strategy in the world today, <laughs> this is, it's almost true 
for every company, even if you're in a B2B organization, you know, there are end consumers or end folks, there's customers, there's the marketplace. So just think about with everything everywhere, how do I create a source of truth? And that's the point of data strategy. Create the source of truth, let it impact and make sure that your AI is adding value. And then just whatever it is, what are the outcomes we're driving? If we think about AI in this manner, you know, like I'm not trying to womp womp anybody, but I'm just trying to say, yes, think big, think expansive, but be pragmatic about it. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to get across here. And then safety first. I like these are ways to make sure that this doesn't slip away from you, from the ethics, from the security monitoring it like anybody who's worked in ai knows that you know there are things called drift where it gets worse um you have to be able to know what's going on and it should not be a black box and oh by the way the reason ai fails in the past and will continue to fail is because you hand users a black box and they go i don't how does this relate to what i used to do that i know works this is kind of safety first as we say don't do no harm, do no harm, and you will find your way to using AI in a meaningful way. And this was a, a part of my French, a crap ton of content I just went through. So let me try to keep it super duper simple. If AI is part of the data continuum, then let's simplify it. Answer questions to inform decisions and understand outcomes. That's what it's about. Very simple way to think about it. So what are the hardest questions for you to answer? There's probably a data issue there and probably over time, how do we get better at it? Through using AI to make those, an those uh, answers to the questions better and better and faster and faster. That's what it's all about. Second, and be honest, the mix of gut feel and data and decision-making at your organization determines how ready you are for AI. If you're all gut feel and you're trying to go to AI, it's not gonna work. So these are just three questions, that being the second. Here's the last. How do you know if you made the right decision or not? Do you have correlation or do you have causation? Really think about that because at the end of the day, you know, you need to know one, how am I answering this question? And two, how do I know if this question is right? When you throw things into an AI model, you have to know that even more. So please start here. It's simple. There is a lot of crazy words I said, but at the end of the day, like this is where I would start. And Shannon, I sure tried to go as quick as I could, but I'm three minutes over. No, you're great, Nick. This is so good. Thank you so much. So exciting to kick off the first of this uh, series. And so such great content. And again, you know, just a reminder uh, to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to slides and links to the recording and anything else requested throughout. So diving in here, Nick, some of these questions came in like right at the beginning. So there was some questions on people's mind as they came into the webinar. So you may have touched on some of this, but since machine learning is an application of AI that allows machines to extract knowledge from data and learn from it and autonomously, is there a legitimate fear of machine man manipulation or device domination in relation to this Skynet theory? <laughs> and is AI machine learning a clear and present danger in society to today? I mean, yeah, I... <laughs> The Skynet thing, I, you know, I think uh, whether it's Skynet or you think, I don't know if everybody's uh, watched Fallout, which is um, it's a video game, but now it's a series on Amazon. But just this idea that, you know, how could for profit companies, you know, <laughs> turn this just into a complete mess? Yeah, it could happen. Um, however, I do think whether whatever we want to think about Sam and the folks at OpenAI, them forcing people to open up and open a conversation, I think gets us away 
from the Skynet theory and more into um, the Tony Stark, I have Jarvis <laughs> um, theory. So I think, you know, it's a danger, but I'm not, I, I'm going to sound like a superhero. I'm not going to rest until like, I make sure that it's a safe place to live. So that's my answer. Good question. I mean, it can happen, but I, I'm feeling better about it. You know, I hate to say that, but I am. So, Nick, Internet of Things and AI, is there anything interesting happening there that we should know about? Yeah, I mean, there is. I think Internet of Things, um, when we think about all that data, you know, I've been a part of several different projects where how do we do predictive maintenance? How do we know when something's going to, um, when something's going to like break down, how do we prevent that? Um, in the agriculture sector, it, it comes down to like, how do I do edge computing? If you ever hear this edge computing thing, it's really like, I'm on a farm. How do I use any technology to help me? Cause it's really hard. So I've seen a lot of cool things, you know, with IOT, it's really about that is collecting, and I'll just throw with IoT, think about augmented reality. I know that nobody wants to use these very heavy uh, Vision Pro goggles or the Google Glass didn't quite do what we thought it would do. But at the end of the day, the more contextual data we are able to collect from out there, <laughs> I'll just say out there, whether it's a machine or a field or what somebody's doing in their personal life, the more that AI can be, you know, helpful. I just think about a, a day where, you know, could a combination of AI things, um, especially things out in the edge, IoT, AI, AR, VR stuff, could that help inform a doctor on maybe I'm not feeling well and I can get ahead of it? I think we're going to see a lot more cool things and I've already kind of seen it you know, especially in the manufacturing and agriculture space. And I think with the power of AI, it's going to make it a lot easier, especially as they start shrinking those things so that they can be on a phone. So many interesting questions coming up here, Nick. Thank you. So, uh, so along that lines, you know, AI can be used to automate cyber attacks. So it can be used for good things and not so good things. For instance, AI powered bots can be used to carry out uh, attacks, phishing attacks, et cetera. Uh, AI can likewise be used to create advanced persistent threats where attackers use machine learning algorithms to learn about the target network. With that being said, how important is it for IT security professionals to understand the threat landscape that AI introduces? Yeah, I mean, so <sighs> what's interesting is go look up, and I know, Ned, you had a lot of good questions, and hopefully you get to most of them. If not, connect with me on LinkedIn, and we'll figure out a way um, to talk more. But um, look up the zero trust strategy. Um, so for years and years, uh, the Department of Defense have been using like, hey, you have to basically assume <laughs> that somebody internal or external is going to maliciously or not kind of be poking around things or be trying to get aware of it. Obviously, again, AI makes it better. You know, the whole thing, I, I think it kind of, when we heard about, you know, what the Russians were kind of doing around election time, it's like, yeah, but they were doing it. It bothered me. They were doing it so inefficiently, right? Like you could use AI, but in a lot of ways, AI was is already being used. So if anything, you know, Ned, I know we eventually want to get to sleep and not worry about everything, but I think, just think we can use AI to also prevent. So the idea that it's out there and not a secret, it should be, it should feel better um, because that wasn't the case just three years ago. Perfect. Thank you. We've got about six minutes left, so I have plenty of time for a couple additional questions here. So, uh, Nick, what are your thoughts on the aspects of ChatGPT that appear to be self-generated and even the developers can't explain? I mean, yeah, like, again, it was trained on the internet and books and things we don't even know about. 
Um, so if you expect it to be, you know, a wise, that, that's why you, it's a five-year-old genius. It's, it's not wise. It just has a lot of information and it talks a lot. And I'm totally describing my daughter right now. You know, it's, but it's not wise. So if you just try to plug GPT into something, it's not going to work the way you want it. It just won't. And it could be the most powerful GPT. It, it could be whatever. I mean, just go and argue. I, I mean, I don't, I say argue, but like, because I feel when I'm talking to it sometimes, I'm arguing. Um, but at the end of the day, it will, it will do its best to try to answer you. So it's not malicious, but it's also not wise. So how much context are you giving it? Are you giving it the data you want it to answer on? Are you giving it instructions on how you want it to think? That's the power. That's why, you know, whatever people say, you know, humans aren't going away. And that's why I say it's short-sighted for organizations to think that AI, AI can help me cut costs. Sure it can, but then you're losing all, all the creativity and all of the, the knowledge and context that your employees bring. So I just say that because if you try to replace everything with GPT or just think it's going to know it, you're missing the mark. It, it really, it, it really does have to have it's human augmentation, not replacement. So. I love these questions. So Nick, um, custom build credit and risk scoring and loss forecasting models. What, would be the many ways I could best leverage the AI advances. Yeah. Oh man. I mean, you're already in the thick of it, if I'm being honest. Um, Cause when, when organizations come to me and maybe they want a chat, but I don't always, I want to be like, yeah, how's your forecasting going? Um, you know, when it comes down to that, how can, how can AI, close feedback loops that we don't have today. You know, I always I always laugh when, you know, we're tagging web apps and all this stuff, but we're not tagging it to be fed back into a model that helps to understand what happened. So in that case, I would think, you know, and what I suggest is how do you how do you get more information about what really happened and why it happened? And that's where AI is going to help. Thank you. So Nick, uh, does security mean that your prompts and data are private and not accessible by others and not added to the AI database? Yeah, great question there. Um, Cause it's one I have to explain a lot, but when you use, and, and you want to be cognizant of it, right? When you use, you know, an AI application, more and more, you want to just make sure that it is not training on proprietary data. And things like, you know, when you get enterprise licenses for Copilot, when you get enterprise or team licenses for OpenAI, you know, Google Gemini, when you get those, Yes, the intent is that they say, we're not going to use your data to train. Now, there are nuances there where sometimes they might want to not train on what you're necessarily the specific data, but more of what's going on. And But what I found is that, especially with the larger corporations that are getting into this, like Microsoft and Google, um, they are very cognizant that people are worried. So you don't have to worry about it. If you use a closed model, if you use a model that um, says they won't train on your data, I mean, at this point, we have to kind of trust it. But at the end of the day, yes, that is the intent of most of these new applications. That's why I say I started with you know, the availability, like, let's just assume everybody here wants to go to closed, because open is definitely something not for the faint of heart. Oh, well, Nick, I love all these questions. I will get these. Uh, there's a lot, a few additional questions we didn't have time to get to, and I'll get those over to you. 
Uh, and again, just a reminder to everyone, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar uh, with links to the slides and links to the recording. Nick, thank you so much. I'm so excited to kick off this series. What a great start. Yeah, thank you all for attending. It was a blast. Thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a great day.